Has anybody ever heard of the New Libertarian Manifesto? This is just a zine copy of it, and unfortunately, we're totally out of it. I called the Derek, JJ Derek Day one day. I was called very embarrassed when he pointed out that wasn't him. Yeah, okay. But anyway, the New Libertarian Manifesto is where the word barbarism was coined into usage. And just a little clarification, you'll hear the word, you'll hear it pronounced as agorism a lot. And I'm just, I'm a purist. I like agorism. That's the way Samuel Conkin used to pronounce it. And swing your own way, nobody cares. Uh, but anyway. I have a question on that. Why do you prefer that? Why, why, do, you, why do you say that's pure? Uh, because I used to hang out with Sam Conklin when he okay. was writing this, and he pronounced it that way. So. I'm just saying, because there's, no there's no good sound in the Greek alphabet. So. <laughs> and it comes from the... Oh, I'm just saying, God. this is the argument of people. When they, because I say agorist, and we're like, no, it's agorist. I'm like... I have no story on this. It's a good sound. It's not a good sound. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> so just say it however you want. That's the point. I pronounce A-G-O-R-A all the time. I just say agorist. I really don't. On one side of the room, prescriptive this on the other. Yeah. You have one. Okay, so I'm, I'm a purist to the Sam Conkin who mispronounced it. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're a Conkin loyalist. Yeah, I'm a loyalist. That's what it is. So anyway, what? Just a little historical perspective again. In the '70s, um, kind of the the libertarian movement started with. Uh, the ideas of Murray Rothbard and Carl Hess trying to create a left-right coalition of the anti-war activists and the marijuana legalizationists and the lower tax conservatives and all that. And they concepted it as a, uh, a left-right coalition and then some folks came along and started a libertarian party. And folks like Sam Conkin said, no, 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 we're against majoritarian democracy so we can't be involved in parties, let's do other stuff. And back when I first started hanging out in New York City in the laissez-faire bookstore, I would hear all these debates back and forth. And I've got some old tapes in, in a box somewhere uh, that I recorded back then. And there was a debate between Sam Conkin and Gary Greenberg, who was the chair of the Free Libertarian Party of New York, about whether they should do political activism or something else. So Sam Conkin didn't have a whole cogent written out philosophy at the time, and so people asked him for years, well, why don't you like the Libertarian Party? Why do you think we should do something else? So he finally uh, was writing it in 78 and 79, got this published in 1980. And he felt that the word uh, Libertarian had been uh, ruined by the Libertarian Party, and he had to come up with a new word. So he looked around and he found it. I think that's it. You just say whatever you want. That's, my, that's, all, that's the point I'm making. So the Agora was the marketplace. And so, you know, along with concepts that are popularized by people like Murray Rothbard, the, the idea was that there's only two types of actions you can take. There's power and there's market. You know, the political process is power, using power to get what you want. The marketplace is the one where libertarians live. So we can argue till the cows come home about whether you should vote or not. I don't care what, what you do. That's okay. That's fine with me. I'm just telling you what agorism, how it came about or whatever. So. The philosophy uh, as written was that um, to be consistent, uh, libertarians would only work in a marketplace kind of way, in a voluntary way, and that um, doing the, the voting uh, process and uh, promoting candidates would actually, in the end, increase the power of the state, even though you're doing it for the reasons of decreasing the power of the state. He basically said that wouldn't work. So just, just um, read this. This is a place uh, where you can find a link to it and read it online. There's also an audio book so you can listen to it online. Then agorism then advocates the means is counter-economics. And what he said was the establishment economics uh, teaching, the purpose of it is to mystify people. Uh, you know how everybody says, God, ec economics, I don't understand it. This is so dry and boring and all that. It, but he says the purpose of it is to mystify it so people don't know how their money is being stolen from them. If you got more clarity, you'd understand, well, there's this centralized banking system that's owned by this wealthy elite who have this plan to rob everybody's pockets all at once. That's counter-economics. 
is fully, clearly understanding how we're being robbed. So counter-establishment counter e economics got distilled down to counter-economics. -econo and then counter-economics practice, rather than theory, is actually being involved in the economy and being free in what you actually do in all your enterprises. And then if we um, traded with each other, traded with the outside world in the counter-economy, we increased our own freedom, we increased our own prior prosperity, and we create a whole community where we can have a marketplace. And essentially, from time to time, we are going to get attacked. Uh, the state doesn't have all power. You know, um, there are people that burglarize homes, and well, it's against the law, but they don't catch them because the police aren't standing at every door, every house, trying to prevent them from being burglarized. The same thing with the marketplace. People say, well, you can't be in the counter economy. You know, they have laws against that. Well, they can't enforce all the laws. Uh, you know, the, the best example of all is the USSR. They had the most pervasive police state and control of, you know, all times. And yet, there was this thriving underground economy called the Nalevo economy, which is the left-hand economy. And what happened there was, and then I'll turn it over to the rest of the panel. I'm Jack Schmidt, by the way. Uh, the, in the Soviet Union, since everybody worked for the state, but everybody was also a consumer. One of the currencies that they had was everybody had to get forms signed and permissions and all that. Well, the people that they were getting their permissions from were actually their neighbors and friends and whatever. So there, there became a trade where uh, uh, approvals and whatever became another form of currency. And if you wanted to get your pipes fixed or something like that, and a plumber came to you for permission, you say, ah, I give you permission, but I have a leaky sink. And so they would trade in uh, other things than just pure currency because they never had enough rubles. They had uh, ration stamps, and so they traded in that. That was another currency. So this underground economy was like just pervaded everything there. And when the Soviet Union collapsed, the reason they didn't, uh, they had difficult times, but the reason they didn't all starve to death was they already had an economy that worked, because the Soviet economy didn't work. And uh, given that, there's, there's the theory side of things, which is agorism, and agorist practice is really the, the activist side of it, going out and educating, going out and uh, uh, what Konkin says is you, you want to go out and find all the counter-economists, the people that are already in the uh, underground economy, and, and convince them that they shouldn't feel guilty about that. They shouldn't try to reach a point where they can go straight. They should reach a point where they're prosperous and help them build the community of free traders, as it was. So that's one of our educational approaches as we go to people already in the counter-economy. The other side of the educational approach is to go to libertarians who understand the theory, the libertarian economic theories, and try to convince them to become human actors in the counter economy. Sure. That the table? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I'm Andrew. Um, we've been uh, selling baklava online started about 2009, uh, fall of 2009. Just looking for a way to make some extra money, and I kind of saw it as a form of activism that I wanted to get involved with. Uh, I hadn't really put too great thought into it, but I just, I was like a fresh anarchist, and I'm like, I want to do something. So, and I can't move to New Hampshire at the, time, yeah, at the time. So I started doing that, and it got pretty successful, and then uh, I went to Pork Fest in 2010, and sold some food there, I'm sure many of you had some. And so I just wanted, wanted to keep building on that, and see what else I could do. Uh, really it was just about, it was just nice to make some money, and keep it, you know, not have it taken from you, it's kind of a nice thing. Because uh, I was working full time for Comcast at the time. And, uh, you know, when you get your paycheck and you just see hundreds of dollars going away with taxes and social securities. It's no fun. We've all been there, I'm sure. So, uh, I recently just moved up here, uh, Pork Fest last year. And my, my goal was to become a full-time agorist. To, to just finally just make all my income just from, uh, you know, just selling, doing stuff, finding out, finding things that I enjoy doing and finding ways to make money with it. So, really I had an idea of possibly opening like an underground restaurant. And uh, I, I just kind of struggled with that. My first couple months up here, I wasn't, after Pork Fest, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I was trying to find things that I enjoy doing. And it's tough, you know, that's what I tell people who want to make that jump. It's, it's really tough because you have to find things that obviously people want to give you money for. And you have to find people who, you, know, you have to find the target people that want to buy these things. So what I've come to find uh, is that 
if I do a bunch of smaller things that alone wouldn't be able to, I wouldn't be able to finance my life with, it, you know, if I do a couple different things, I can have as much free time as I need for things, and I can do my work on my own time. So for me, it's, it's kind of turned into, you know, I still do my own Ibaka bus sales, and that alone is not enough to run my life. Um, I also do some cooking nights, like at the uh, Keen Activist Center. I'm looking to start up again in Manchester. Um, so again, those by themselves wouldn't be enough. But what really, what I really found my, my niche is, is that I enjoy, I've always enjoyed, found the most at peace when I'm at home just cooking and when I'm cleaning. And I kind of started doing that. So I, I picked up some, some clients and I do uh, house cleaning and cooking. So for me, agorism was really, I mean, it, always, it was just about making money, I mean, for myself, that I could keep for myself, you know, not paying taxes. I don't consider myself an activist. I consider myself a businessman. Um, I mean, that's, I guess some people disagree, but I mean, that's fine. That's, you know, I, I think you should be able to keep what you make. That, that's the most important thing for me. But, um, but yeah, that's really what I encourage people is just find things that you enjoy doing. That's really what it's about. And uh, just just try to just find ways to make money that, that you like to do. Because, you know, when I was going, when I was doing the eight to five grind, it just, you, you really, you're not really motivated to do much. You just kind of go to work, do your thing, whatever. So you have you have to really self motivate yourself to get going, and you can start small. You can start with something that you know, like I said, just something small that you like to do that people you can sell on eBay or whatever. I don't know, start there or you know, Craigslist, whatever. But uh, yeah, when you finally make that jump, it's it's really nice. It's rewarding. It just, it just takes a lot of work. It requires a lot of self motivation and, and a lot of hard work. But those are the, the biggest things in my opinion that you need to have. But, uh, yeah, so I'm up here now and uh, doing my thing. I have to stand here, just try to do, just do some work whenever. But uh, is your question? Yes. Uh, yeah. I was wondering how you do it. So clients that want, want to pay you by credit card or check or whatever. I, I presume you want to bar you want to barter or cash or I silver mean, or something, right? Yeah, I mean, I I take like my stand right now. I I mean, I take Bitcoin, cash, credit card. Um, Credit card? Gold, silver. Yeah, I have a, uh, I don't have it on me, but I have, maybe some people have seen it before. It's a little, square. it's called Square. No, yeah, I, it plugs into my phone and I just swipe the card. Right, but that that kind of goes a little bit more above ground. Than it does. You're right. <laughs> and I understand that. Uh, I mean, that's not my primary, I primarily deal in cash. Because, I mean, no matter what, you, just, you know, I can't go to the grocery store with silver. Mm -hmm. you know, I have silver, of course, I, I'll take it as payment, but I still need a certain amount of cash. Yeah, yeah, we all do. No yeah, sure, exactly. So I don't, I don't have a problem taking those things, um, and I'm, I'm pretty public about what I do. I, I, I think that's, I think it's good to put yourself out there. I mean, maybe it's, it's higher risk, but I don't know. I don't, I don't want to. State doesn't come for you yet. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and I don't, I, I don't really want to. You know, I want to show people, hey, you can do this. It works. You know, I, I don't see what the big deal is for me. I'm just making food for people or you know, cleaning a house. <coughs> I suppose in this state it's a lot easier because you're not expected to collect sales tax for the state. You're not expected to report income tax to the Our state. Guy, you know more I know. So, yeah. <laughs> so somewhere where, where yeah. you have those things, you've got a lot higher risk if you try to go yeah. to the market. Or and, and I think moving up here has been very helpful uh, because, I, I, you know, the community's here and you can work within that. And then obviously I want to expand out beyond that. So I'm constantly looking to to do more work and pick up more more jobs. But really, it's just I, I love what I do. I wake up you, on my own like at 7 a.m. I don't need to go you know to an office or anything. But I, I get up and I get to work and I do things, and it's all on my own time. Really, I just schedule you know things with my clients and work things out, and it's great. I mean, I I it's just I'm probably at this point now I could say that I'm definitely making more than I did with Comcast. So that you know, nice I, I spent some time there. So and that's when you factor in, you know, with all the taxes and everything, definitely. Like actual money that I'm getting, yeah. But but I'm working a lot. I mean, if you see if you see me at Fort Fest, you might, you know, I stand all this back there, we you know, we we bust our buzz to get that work done. Um, it's like that every day. Well maybe not that like that. But you know what I mean? Like I don't I don't have, it, that's really what it's about. You have to you really have to work hard at it. But you you don't have to make that jump to just if you're thinking about starting a business, you don't have to go hardcore and just, you know, I, I didn't. There were, there were, like I said, there were a couple months after I moved up here where I was 
kind of just like, what do I want to do? And, you know, I had I had the profits before this. I, I was I wasn't I was okay, but I wasn't doing much, and it's just I needed it wasn't very fulfilling at the time, so I had, I had to find work. And really, nobody's gonna be there like, hey, you know. No one's gonna be over your shoulder. You're telling you like, oh, you really need to get this done. So it's, it's up to you. But so that's that's really where I come from with with agorism. It's like Jack said. You know, there's more. There's some people that have you know, they ed educate, and I guess I educate through what I do in some ways. But I don't. You know, I don't really have philosophical discussions about it. I mean, I, I'll talk about it, sure. But for me, like I said, the most important thing is just about providing the service that people want and you know making some money. Yeah. I was just curious, what are your future plans with your business? Like, do you plan on expanding, maybe opening a store or a restaurant or anything like that? No, I, I really don't want to. I really don't want to deal with, uh, I, I grew up in a restaurant business. My family's had restaurants, aunts, uncles, I've worked in them all my life, since I was 12, up until you know, last year when I moved. So and I'm 31 now, so I'll be 32 soon. And, uh, I, I just know, I just remember the inspectors coming in and checking things out. It's so ridiculous. Like once a year, that's going <coughs> to, the, the whole place can be dirty any other time, but then that one time a year, you clean everything up. And it, it, there's so many ridiculous things that I would see. Like if you go to a restaurant if, and they wrap the silverware, you know, like the napkins rolled up and the silverware is inside of it. I, I saw situations where one inspector would see the way you had the silverware wrapped and they're like, oh, it's fine. But then like maybe someone else comes in next year and you're doing it the same way and they're like, no, you can't do this. You have to redo it this way. <coughs> And it's just, I, it's just so many ridiculous things like that. And it's, it, it's just an online store. Yeah, I have, I have the online thing now, of course. And I, and I actually do want to expand because I've, I've been eating uh, paleo for about almost a year now, and there are some products I want to offer that because I make, I make these great cookies and cakes and uh, pies, and I'd love to be able to sell them. You know, I've really, I've really been experimenting with stuff. I, I, I love, you know, like I said, I love being in the kitchen. So. You know, fortunately, people need to eat every day. Fortunately for me, so it's like I can make make some money with that. I understand it can be harder. Some people have passions where, you know, oh, I like to fish. Well, okay, you can make money being a professional fisher, but you know, competitive fisher. I don't know. Let's <laughs> just throw another example. I mean, there's, it, it, it's it's easier for me, I think, because, and and really the most important thing I think as an agorist uh, to be successful is your reputation. It really is all about, you know, people people. Know what to expect from you. You know, so you start out, someone's basically taking a risk with you because they, they don't know what you can do, or you know, if you're gonna flake out on them or whatever. So, I just, I, it's important for me to be on time for the work I do and meet deadlines with, with people who want something by a certain date. And I, you know, you do that, you handle that with every customer. I think it really builds on that. Or like at Pork Fest. And we have fun too. I mean, like I said, yeah, obviously you need to make money. I mean, we all do. We all need to make some income, but. Why shouldn't you have fun doing it? Of course you should. I mean, that's important. You know, people come out there from all over the country, something like Corpus, and it's like, you're part of that experience. You want to provide them, you know, you want to be part of that. And they want, they're going to, you know, you're going to be there next year. You want them to come back. They're going to be there all week. You want to come back the next day. So, yeah, have some fun. You don't, you don't have to try. try you'll have fun, you know. It's, it's an awesome time. So, yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. Right. Right. Cool. Uh, so I'm Ron Helwig, um, probably a lot of you have seen my Shire Silver. Um, I uh, started off with the Liberty Dollar um, in 99, um, so I've been doing this for a little while. I uh, moved to New Hampshire as part of the Free State Project in 2005 and uh, really wanted to get that ramped up and finally got a group of people organized to try to get it moving right when Bernard got attacked by the JBTs. Um, so we scrambled, came up with a better idea, and I've been moving that forward. Uh, it's specifically targeted uh, on, towards the, the monetary system. We really want to get that reformed, and uh, so we're trying to push that from the agorist point of view of this is specifically not government money. Um, government messes that up. Every time it touches money, it messes it up. Um, so we're staying away from, from that stuff. Uh, trying to make it easy to use and trying to convince normal people, people who aren't necessarily us, to to get involved with it. What you know, why? 
What's the benefit to people that don't care about sound money or freedom, that are just trying to live their lives? Uh, we need to get them on board as well. Uh, so I'm working on that. Um, George has been a, a great help with the, because, uh, you know, pork fest. Sure. Accepting it. Um, Ofer has been accepting it as well. Uh, lots of other places are, are accepting it, not necessarily, you know, publicizing it. We understand that a lot of people have business models that uh, they don't necessarily want publicized, but uh, we're working on that. Uh, so we've got the website up, we're getting sales, sales are increasing now. Um, yes, we are, you know, using the credit cards for when we have to, PayPal. Um, we're working on getting Bitcoin acceptance. Um, we've got to get that working. Um, Bitcoin, love, love the idea. The implementation seems to be really good. We're, uh, we're pushing that forward as uh, that's what you use online. If you want anonymous cash in person, Shire Silver, that's the way to go. Um, so, you know, if we get these things working, we all push forward with the, the agorist strategies, <coughs> we're gonna win. I'm looking at it now, seeing what's been happening. We've got, we've got the, the guys doing the dime cards, We've got the people, um, other people using the, the Shire Silver model. Um, this guy down in Arizona, with the, the he's got his own bar. He's been doing them. Oh, yeah. Nice yeah. one. And uh, and of course. Oh, that's a nice looking card. Yeah. Yeah. One of, one of my you, favorite. I'm glad you remember because I forgot mine. I was gonna have one. Yeah. One. Um, yeah. So and you know these these cards are also a great way to advertise your business. Um, you can use them as, uh, you know, they're, they're cheap enough, especially the, the lower end ones, this one is worth about a buck, um, that you can use them as your business card. It's a business card that they won't throw away. Um, as you can tell, because I'm still his. Um, after having it for several months. Yeah. Um, so there, there's, there's Actually, a lot for the record, I gave, that, I gave that to your kid. Yeah, 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 yeah it's not yeah. mine. It's, it's not, but, um, <laughs> he'll get it later. Um, he, he's played with it. Just, just reminding so. you. Yeah, it's not your property. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so it's 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 all coming together, and because these other people are starting to do it now, uh, this I think is the key to the safety. Um, I've got it set up now. I, I've got. The instructions how to run the business including passwords and everything all in an encrypted document that the cops could come in they could take me away today and it wouldn't stop anything um, it's it's all out there it's it's going to continue and with all these other people starting to do it now um, hey I look at it as I've won we've we've defeated government money it's now just a matter of time and effort. The idea is there, and you can't stop the idea. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, okay. uh, down in Austin, we were uh, giving away uh, trading eggs for a silver dime, a dozen of eggs for a silver dime. Uh, and uh, we're coming across a problem. There's a, there's a lot, I think it's Gresham's Law, or something like that, where the bad money is what gets used up first. So. People, we wanted to peg a commodity, a dozen eggs, to uh, 2.25 grams of silver, which is in a dime, I think. Same thing with like one of your grams or whatever it be, would be. So a problem happens when inflation keeps kicking up and silver's worth more. If the guy down the road is, is giving away a dozen of eggs for two dimes, a lot of people are going to be incentivized to go ahead and up the prices. But and it's set, in a sense, we're still tied to the monetary system and its manipulation. Do you have any strategies to, to help overcome that and to peg something to weight to the actual commodity? Because I think that would be able to, to help uh, a great deal. Well, well, I think one of the one of the things to do is to list both prices. Um, you know, in your store or whatever, on your websites, list, you know, here's here's what we're selling this for in dollars, here's what we're selling this for in silver. Um, and just over time, you're gonna watch. The price in silver is gonna stay fairly stable, while the price in dollars is going to rise. Um, and the more people see that, 
the more they're going to come to understand and become educated about what sound money is and why we need it. Um, there is also the fact that uh, you know you can you can play up the advantages of the silver. You know you can do the in-person education, uh, explaining to people why it's it's more valuable. And actually, one of the advantages of the Shire silver is it is slightly higher than the spot price, which means Gresham's law is actually working in our favor when compared to the regular bullion. Um, your, your regular bullion is going to be much closer to the spot price, but it's also heavier and harder to use, so people are going to end up having the Shire Silver or the dime cards in their wallets. <coughs> so that's what I, when I sell it, I, I usually try to remind people, hey, yeah, this, this is what goes in your wallet. You know, yeah, the, 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 the coins, the rounds, they're beautiful, they're impressive when you hold them in your hand. You can really feel the value, but that's not what you carry around for everyday use. You stick those in your, in your safe. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's an ongoing uh, process to try to figure out, yes, how do we educate, how do we sell, how do we market these things? And yeah, I'm still, still working on that too. And the more we the more we discuss it, the more we talk about it, the better ideas we'll come up with. Can you give us an idea of the number of people who actually trade in your silver or other people's silver, and where it started and where it's going? Like, is there a trajectory? Um, yeah, uh, I would I would have to guess at how many people, but I'm fairly confident that it's well over 200 people that have it. Probably just, you know, here in New Hampshire. In the Manchester area alone, I would I would say it's probably well over a hundred. Um, I know there's over thirty thousand dollars worth of it out in circulation. And my goal for this year is to get that over a hundred thousand. That's that's gonna be a hard hard push to get it there, but it's but it's doable. Um, What is Gresham's Law? Um, well, that's a good question. Gresham's Law, most people say, most people use the compact version of it, which is bad money drives out good money. Um, because people are, if you've got, in your wallet, if you've got some silver and you've got some dollars, the dollars are inflating. So you're going to want to use those first. So when you're trading with someone, if they'll take either of them, you know, you're, you're going to want to give them the, the bad money and get that out of your possession and keep the good money. However, Gresham's Law is actually a little more precise than that. And it refers to legal tender laws. So it's that the, the bad money drives out the good money when you have legal tender laws forcing you to use the bad money in the first place. We... Uh, our legal tender laws here are actually a little more restrictive than, than you would think. They're basically, you have to use it, you have to accept it if someone is trying to use it to pay off a debt, um, and you have to use it to pay your taxes. Um, but if you're running a business, you can, you can refuse to actually accept it. Like if you're selling some baklava, you can say, no, I don't want that. Um, now, if you've already if you've already sold it, you've made a deal, and they come back later and want to pay off the debt, then you have to accept it at that point. But you know, there's plenty of cases out there where people are saying, you know, we we don't accept anything over a 50 after 10 at night, or you know, our drivers don't have so much change. Uh, we don't accept pennies or nickels. Uh, so it is. We have a lot more flexibility. And, uh, I'm just curious about what kind of denominations you're doing, like, uh, yeah. the different cards, like, yep, <laughs> uh, I, I don't actually have all of them with me, I'm missing one, but I have a, a half gram silver, and that goes for about a dollar, the, my MSRP today is like a dollar five, um, the one gram silver, 
in uh, that's two bucks basically. Five gram silver is about ten. Twentieth uh, of a gram of gold is four bucks, and a tenth of a gram of gold is eight bucks, and then a half gram of gold are forty bucks. So, and that's it does a pretty good job of covering your everyday transaction stuff, except for, of course, uh, change, you know, the small change. One of the things I was thinking that should be done eventually is, I've, I've always thought that it was the way our American currency system was, was backwards. We use coins for small change, and we use bills for the big denominations. That's backwards. We should be using the coins for the big things and using the paper for the small things. I mean, who's really going to care if you're counterfeiting a 25 cent note? Um, you're just going to accept it because, you know, even if it is a fake, it's not that big of a loss. Um, so I was thinking the kind of kind of the same thing could happen with the cards is once we get to the point where enough people are using it, we could have some kind of warehousing system where you would have, you know, fractional cards being out there that wouldn't necessarily have the metal in them, because it, it does actually, it's it's not real cheap to make the cards. Um, so coming up with something that would be cheaper for doing uh, smaller denominations would help to make the smaller change. People hate coins though. I mean, us in the freedom movement that like the sound money, we like them because we understand it. But the general public really hates coins. I mean, there's there's supposedly like millions of dollars worth of dollar coins sitting in vaults in the, in the D.C. area because nobody, nobody will use them, and because they've got stupid laws that are like, well, for every Susan B. Anthony you have to have, or Sacagawea, you have to have one of the presidents or one of the states or, or these things. So they're producing all these coins that nobody wants and they're just sitting in vaults. Yeah. So, you know, that's another another advantage to the Shire Silver model is it's getting people away from the coins. Another explanation for that though is that those dollar coins are badly designed. Well that too, yeah. So it's hard to say which reason that people don't like the well, particular but like pennies. Um, you know, a lot of people they're worthless. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the reason that people use things like credit cards and debit cards is just because then they don't have to mess with change. Um, if you get if you get to the point where you're using a reserve system and you're you're thinking of issuing fractional cards, is there any reason that those cards couldn't work like credit cards or work like uh, like any other digital? Like oh sure. You, like instead of having a serial number on a specific point in the vault, could I have an account? For an undenominated measurement, or a denominated measurement, but not a physical. I'm not, I'm not well, I, you know I, what I, mean? I think I know what what you're getting at. Like there could be a gold brick in a vault, and we could all own a share of it. <coughs> yeah, sure. Um, and that's that's really what you know. Some of these places <laughs> like uh, E Gold and Gold Money, uh, Tunix, <coughs> they've been trying to do that um, to have a, a debit card that's hooked up to, but the governments keep getting in the way. So we we could do this. It would, it would, you know, from a technical standpoint, it's easy. But government gets in the way and will stop it. We have to get the governments out of the way before that's going to become a reality. And and I, I do want to say that I don't want to be the bank. I don't want to be the one that's actually doing it. I'm just putting that idea out there. Um, you know, like... Well, I think... Yeah. <laughs> what, if I understood correctly, what you're saying is that Shire Silver has solved the problem the Liberty Dollar had by being more distributed. Yeah. So is there a way to use the vault concept in a oh, more distributed way? I've been thinking about that uh, for, for a while, and really what you need to have for something like that is some kind of distributed vaulting system where it can be audited anonymously. And, and, you know, without, you know, if, if like, say you have a safe at home and, and you can put stuff in there, I've got one at home, he's got one at home, they've got one, and these can all be put a webcam inside. fungible, 
you know, yeah, see, that's the kind of discussion that has to be had. You don't want to know what that's I do in my vault. <laughs> <laughs> what do you have in there? <laughs> but, you know, having some way of, of doing that and setting up that system in such a way that it, that the government couldn't come in and break it. Um, once somebody figures out how to do that, then yes, that can be done. Um, but at this point, with stuff like Bitcoin, it's almost irrelevant. It's not necessary. I mean, we can we can all be using things like Bitcoin for the small change, for the the debit card situation, and then and it's my understanding is Bitcoin isn't necessarily anonymous, but it can be if you if you use it right. Um, so so for you know online stuff. And if you're careful, you can use bitcoins to do anonymous transactions. And my Shire Silver is always available as a cash type anonymous transaction. Just a quick comment on uh, small coins and uh, vendors accepting silver. Last year at Porkfest, I ate lunch for a week on $2 in silver dimes. And every vendor I asked, which is probably half a dozen of them, accepted it. And I never had more than about $2 in Federal Reserve notes in my hand at any given time. But the Federal Reserve notes and uh, the uh, fake dimes, quarters, and nickels serve as good small change. So that stuff's not going to disappear overnight, even if the dollar does. Yeah. All right. Okay. Hi. Uh, my name is Paper. Um, uh, Free Stater moved to New Hampshire 2007 from Los Angeles. I live in Manchester. And I'm guessing Wallace put me on this panel because. About a year and a half ago, I opened a private libertarian community center in Manchester called The Quill. But I don't really want to talk about The Quill because <laughs> we've already had two examples of actual businesses. I'd rather talk about theory. And it's actually perfect that George and Ron preceded me because I want to talk about two subdivisions. I want to talk about business and I want to talk about currency. <laughs> Mandrake. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Mandrake and Ron. Um, in terms uh, specifically of uh, what to expect, what I think the stages of growing the counter economy are, and what the pieces are that need to happen and why. Um, and in New Hampshire in general, but especially in the greater area of Manchester, because we have by far the greatest concentration, uh, we have over 200 porcupines in the greater Manchester area, and geographic proximity is very important. That's the heart of the free state plan. Um, so on the first topic, um, agorist business. Um, I like to divide them in my mind into two categories. The first one is sort of sustainable in the public eye, and that would be like the baklava store. You just got a website, nobody cares where you are, no one's really looking for you, it's great. Um, or your other example of just doing house cleaning for people, who's gonna get involved in that? The second one is not sustainable in the public eye, and that's any place where you have to have a physical storefront to actually meet, be a customer-facing business, or if you have, or they are in a professional capacity, like say a doctor or an accountant, where you either don't have a license or you have a license but are breaking the terms of the regulated body, that's not sustainable in the public eye. And therefore, anyone who wants to go into agorism in that area is generally limited to doing so within an <coughs> agorist community. Now, we have the largest agorist community, probably, let's say, per square mile uh, in the greater Manchester area, probably compared to anywhere else in the US. But it's finite. And that means that only certain things are achievable at this time. But there's a sequence of tipping points that we will be hitting as we scale, and I think those tipping points accelerate. So let's say with 200 people, if you're an agorist barber, and there's a very talented agorist barber in Manchester, and she does maybe say a dozen haircuts uh, every week or every month for various people, um, which incidentally would not be profitable if you had to actually visit the person's home, but because she hangs out at the Libertarian Community Center, um, it makes it economically feasible because other people just have to go there, which they often go to anyway, so they schedule an appointment for when they're planning on that. Uh, so that was, that was, that was uh, having the center in that sense is key for lowering the transaction overhead for that particular industry of haircut. But still, it's only a side business. She could not operate full time and pay her bills as a barber, but with 500 or 700 people, she might. So that means that when we get to that certain scale of total number of people, we hit that tipping point where she can now be a full-time agorist barber, and that's great. Now, um, each industry or each profession probably has a different tipping point. I don't know what a doctor would be. Uh, doctors obviously make more money per client, so maybe you need less clients. 
Um, but if you were running, say, a restaurant, you might need a thousand people, especially if it's a particular kind of food, because not everyone's going to want to eat Ethiopian every single day. So if you had a secret Ethiopian restaurant that was only catering to agorists, you'd probably have to wait a while before you can do that. But the point is, we're already really big, and it's only going to keep growing faster and faster. So essentially what I'm saying is, come to New Hampshire, and especially come to Manchester, right? Because that's what Liberty Forum is all about. It's all about what the Free State Project can accomplish and why you should be coming here. Um, so that's, that's sort of how I see the growth of the counter-economy in that sense. Now the other thing is currency. Um, and Gresham's Law has already been covered, which is great. Um, the laws are laws because they have the final say in the long term, but they don't always have the final say in the short term. Um, the whole point of the Free State Project is that we can, through our irrational exuberance, our passion for liberty, in the short term, make the water go back up the river. We can make government get smaller, even though it is a natural law that government always gets bigger and more tyrannical. Um, the same is true of Gresham's Law. Through our irrational exuberance for liberty, a lot of us use silver, even though it makes no sense to use silver. If you get paid in dollars, uh, it may, and the person accepts both dollars and silver, why would you go out and trade dollars for silver and then buy the product in silver? You just buy the product in dollars. But the irrational exuberance is there, so we just need to bring the difficulty <coughs> below the level of irrational exuberance, not below the level of Russian. And I think the key to doing that is to complete the circuit. If you're getting paid in silver, and if you can pay in silver, then it starts to make sense. So we already have a lot of porcupines that own property and rent out rooms or apartments to other porcupines. That's an opportunity to pay the rent in silver or partially in silver. It can be a fraction. And we can grow that fraction over time. Um, most agorists pretty much work for themselves, but let's say you get really successful and you hire someone to start doing shipping and delivery for you. Now you are employing, uh, we have porcupines employing porcupines, which means you could pay them in silver. Maybe they prefer to get paid in silver, or maybe you just think it's fun so you want to do it and it's worth the effort of acquiring silver. Um, but if you're getting paid in silver, you've already got silver, so you're going to spend it in silver. We have to complete that cycle and it's a tricky thing because the cases where that makes sense are few and far between. Like even if you own an apartment building and you're renting out to porcupines and they want to pay you in silver, if you have a mortgage, then you still have to pay the mortgage in cash. But if you're fairly well off and you like to accumulate $1,000 in silver every month just for savings, you might as well have that silver coming from your rent as opposed to other sources and then you can afford to let people pay you in silver at least to that degree. But Although it starts with just inches and toe holds in the beginning, it can grow pretty quickly with scale and it will accelerate it. It's, it's, it's extra linear, it's, it's um, exponential. Um, so I'm not sure exactly where we are in the exponential curve. People like to overstate where they are in the exponential curve, I don't wanna do that. Um, but we're definitely already starting to see some fun stuff, if not world changing stuff. And I don't think we're more than a, a year or two away from some really practical stuff, if not world changing stuff. We're maybe five to 10 years away from world changing stuff. Uh, but we can have a lot of fun and we can make profit and we can do so in the agora um, in the very near term. Um, so keep moving to New Hampshire. Uh, I guess questions. Yes, Dale. Um, I, I asked someone, I came in late, so I was told by someone that this probably hasn't been discussed really. Mm -hmm. One thing that I've seen as an impediment to using silver as a currency is that a whole lot of people, it, it, its value is changing a lot. It's not just inflation that causes it to change value. There are things in the market for silver that affect the value and things like that. So it doesn't tend to go up and down. Um, and I find people, my impression is I see a lot of people that are really speculating and seeing it more as an investment. Mm -hmm. They want to buy when it's low, they want to sell when it's high. Mm -hmm. And so they don't necessarily want to spend their silver at a time when silver's lower than that when it's dropped recently or if it's spiked recently, you'll see people posting messages all of a sudden, oh, I'm desperate for cash, I need, to, I need to sell some silver. Well, yeah, it just spiked. <laughs> That's why they seem to want to sell it. And so that seems to me to be an impediment and I see a whole lot of a huge margin for someone who wants there's a typically coinage has a spot. Uh, what's it called? The uh, what do you call it? A little bit above spot. <coughs> a bit. Or ask. 
premium, premium on the premium, premium. on the coin. Usually smaller coins are a little more, premium, a little higher premium, yes. and so forth. And you know that it, it doesn't trade at a consistent value. Right. It seems like they want everyone wants the margin when they're when they're selling it, and they want to sell it at, or they want to buy it at face value, and things like that. Well, there's or, a, the spot, and then there's the premium value. for the medium, right? Right. And and so I see. Uh, I see um, a whole lot of speculation constantly happening that seems to impede actually using it as a currency. That's just my that's my experience having lived in New Hampshire for a while and seeing people exchanging silver. So, so I was wondering what your thoughts on that. Well, I guess well, how would we overcome that? Um, okay, so you're saying that people buy it when they think it's low relative to basically relative to their the last month of prices. It's it's all it's not for their expectations. They're, they're expecting it to go up in the long run, but when it dips and peaks. Uh, in short term, and that's right. why people want to, they seem to want to speculate on it rather than just use it as a currency because well, it does vary a lot in value. Well, when we have a very small fraction of our uh, counter economy being transacted in silver, let's say like you know two percent or three percent, then that could pretty much halt all transactions to silver for a little while. Um, you still have a little bit of irrational exuberance pushing that above zero. Like for example, Brian refused to sell his eggs for anything but silver, so you better find some silver if you want to buy his eggs. But obviously, that's not enough to make make the complete change happen. But as we increase, I think the fraction of the economy or the fraction of the transactions that are happening in silver, you simply aren't going to be able to run completely away from silver just because it spiked and you don't want to sell it, or it fell and you don't want to sell it, it spiked and you don't want to buy it. Um, because part of your liquid assets are in silver, and if it's a larger part, then um, if, let's say, sorry, I'm coming at this the opposite way. If the fraction of your assets currently in dollars are not large enough to cover sort of your operating budget, to use business terms, although I'm applying it even to a personal lifestyle thing, um, then you're going to have to let go of some of your silver just to pay your normal bills or do your normal lifestyle choices. Um, so the larger the fraction of transactions in silver, I think the less will be affected by it. But it actually it reminded me of the question that someone else, I think it was John, might have asked the question about. Um, oh, uh, the divergence between dollar prices and silver prices and how that can really screw things up. Um, again, uh, it's not solvable in the short term, but I think if more and more people had dual pricing, they could uh, they would accept or use dollars or silver, and more a larger percentage of our transactions happen in silver, um, we could get to the point where if it diverges too much, enough of our economy uh, is running on a silver option that we can abandon the dollar economy and just go to the silver economy. And we'd probably be more limited in the goods and services that are available to us. Um, but it would be better, like in the case of a complete dollar collapse. Um, but in the short term, it is, it is a pain in the ass. I mean, if you're, I don't know, like raising and selling pigs and you're trying to uh, sell them for silver, but you paid for your feed in dollars, and things can get really, really hairy. Um, and I don't know how one can smooth that out except through scale. Scale solves a lot of problems. Um, is there any in accepting silver? Um, There's several. Several. Um, for example, this this barber. Um, how would I? Does she accept silver? Or, uh, uh, I have no idea. You okay. can ask her. Okay. Okay. Well, so how would I find out about her to ask her? Well, Sorry. because I just told you word of mouth. I mean, she's not like advertising. I, I understand. Like okay. So, like yeah. where, where is this place? There's no comprehensive por uh, porcupine or agorist business directory. Okay. okay. I, I, I don't think there ever really for that will be. Um, just because we're, I kind of want to make I know everybody wants to make one. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think there will be. We've got the, the black and yellow pages. I just. I just got a. Oh, black and yellow pages. Okay. Nice. I, ju I just got an order. Let's see uh, John Bush's two there. Okay. Um, I mean, I've got. But that's for Texas, right? Yeah. Okay. Right. No, this is probably this national. Is it's national. Yeah. Me and Catherine actually debated on whether it should be a Central Texas local thing or just national. Okay. And she pushed more towards the national thing. So there's all sorts of different stuff. Uh, like you can order stuff, and there's web work. But we'd eventually like to break it down so you can search by city. So as you're traveling across the country. You're in Phoenix, Arizona. You know, looking for a restaurant to go to. You can look there to see if there's any place that accepts silver or barter. Okay, but to get back, to, you mentioned a place, and I don't remember what some place in Manchester where this barber hangs out. And yes. What, 
Where is it? Are there it's, other? It's called the Quill, the Quill. and uh, I, I think there should be flyers lying around. Uh, there's a flyer that says Liberty Forum Plus, okay. and it's an itinerary of all the cool things we're doing at the Quill during Liberty Forum. Okay. Like for example, tomorrow night from 10 to 12, we're going to have the first 1,000 movers party, oh, and okay. Carla is going to be there. Oh, yeah. okay. This flyer. And the address of the club is on there. Uh, we used to be a lot more secret than this, but for the sake of Liberty Forum, <coughs> we just decided to take a chance and publish our address and open our doors. Okay. There, there's a lot of stuff going on at that place. It's okay. Cool. I will go. If you haven't been there, check it out. It's okay. Cool. Um, okay. But there's also, um, you know, there's the, the the black and yellow pages. It it sounds like it's a great concept. That's that's going to move in some great directions. Um, I've got merchants listed on my website. Uh, I know, you know, I know you've seen on NH Free. Uh, right, right. They, there's been people posting there. Um, there's at least three different pages on NH Free that are all, hey, let's start a let's start a directory. Yeah. Um, and I, I understand the reasons why you can't really get too public with the directory. I understand that. So, well, it's you know I don't think there's going to be any you know this is the one central place where you're going to find everything you need. Right, right. Right. But I think by having several of them out there, um, especially if they start linking to each other, um, you know, hey, if you can't find it here, go to this place. Right. Um, then it's it's going to all come together and Google search, you know. Yeah. Did I clarify something? Uh, I think we can have a public directory of everyone who accepts silver. We can't necessarily have a public directory of every agorist. I, I understand that. Yeah. So the yeah, too, yeah. the one yeah, but the place if there were a public directory of just people accepting silver, then it'd be a good starting place. So well, um, have you seen the the silver annex? Uh, he's trying to take it from the other side. Not just um, who's accepting it, but who wants to use it. Right. Um, and that can be a, a great marketing tool to use to get other businesses signed up. Um, so we can say, like in the Manchester area, if we can get enough of the people that have, you know, silver, whether it's whether it's the Shire silver or whether it's just regular bullion, go to the site, signed in, um, then we can point to other merchants. And say, you know, go into them and say, hey, look, there's, you know, 150 people within a five-mile radius of your store that want to use silver. Will you accept it? And I think that will be a, an awesome marketing tool. I have a question, kind of, for the panel, I guess, and for anybody. What do, what do you think? I, I know a lot of people are worried about the government or uh, all kinds of things coming down on them for running their business. What, what, what's your opinions on? Um, being a private ag agorist or being a public agorist. I'm, I'm asking as someone who's always has been public pretty much from day one. And, I mean, geez, I even had that NPR thing last for, <laughs> yeah, exactly. where I had relatives call me and they're like, I heard you want NPR, and you know they live like states away, and I'm like, what? <laughs> I think that as long as you stay well, both low key and low scale, your risk is pretty low. Where you get the high risk is if, if you Either are very very public about well, it. Well, let me let me. Okay. I'm not I'm not necessarily saying about the risk. I'm just saying, would you? I, I personally take the stance that being public is beneficial because it encourages others to also you know start something. It's like the difference between smoking weed at home and smoking weed at 420 at the park. Yeah, I don't know. Right? It's are you just trying to smoke weed or are you trying to do it publicly to show people yeah, what but, it really looks like and but, do but that's, other people? But that's a whole other issue, and I mean we could talk about that, but. But some people would see that and be like, oh, these people are out here making trouble. Whereas they're like, what, you know, what are they going to say? Oh, this guy's making a sandwich. You know, right. Clearly, yeah. he hates children. <laughs> right. you know, they can't make that argument like they can with weed. It's you know? a relevant question because suppose we did have a directory. You'd, you'd want to know, okay, what's the risk if I add my name as a vendor to this directory? Yeah, well, of course there's the, I mean, yeah. yeah. I'm, just, well, I'm, yeah. Just, I'm, just more, I'm just more looking like, what, what do you guys think? Like, do you agree? Like, I'm, I'm just, I just well, try to encourage people to be more public about it. Here's I, my, I really my case is, um, when, when I first started out doing this, um, I knew that I was the only one doing it. And if they came in and they stopped me, that mm -hmm. might have been the end of it. Um, so my, I kept my growth rate somewhat slower and, and haven't been promoting it as much until it got to the point where the organic growth has gotten it past the danger zone. So now I'm a lot more comfortable going out and promoting it publicly and, and trying to spread, you know, not only sell my, my brand, but sell the model. Mm -hmm. um, the model has, has sold enough that the brand is safer, um, I guess is a, a <coughs> way to put it. 
So, so now, now I can be more open because I've done the groundwork. And, and it's a legitimate fear. I mean, it, it's scary stuff. I mean, I mean the you, government you got serious someone business. in the back there who uh, who is familiar with uh, yes the sound money dangers. <laughs> I, I'll uh, I'll tell you what the Bi Bi uh, not the Bible the New Libertarian Manifesto says. <laughs> uh, he basically says um, liberty is going to be built uh, person to person, you know, one at a time. And um, so he says you you can't really afford to confront them until there's an agorist protection uh, syndicate as well. Yeah. So it's like. Um, Dispute resolution and protection, they're all businesses in this kind of thinking. And so, um, uh, I, I don't go public with what I do, and so I'm kind of like violating that principle by being here, but... Uh, I, I mean, so but, it, but it's understandable. I, I can understand why. I mean, it, it's, it is really scary. Yeah, yeah. You know? Well, but, I mean, uh, I, I would never have gone in New Hampshire in like 2005 and done the things that Lauren Canario did. Oh, right. But I might consider doing it now. Uh, so you know, so so those people who do things way before you think it would be wise to start doing them. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't do them, but I guess I'm glad they're out there because they can set good examples and good things over time. But it, yeah, it all comes down to what's your goal and what's your risk level. And I definitely agree that uh, running a business is a much better form of civil disobedience than smoking weed in the park. You know, let's get arrested for being productive. Yeah, you're right. It's I mean, the perfect example are the people who feed. Down in Florida, down in Orlando, that were right. feeding homeless That's people. Awesome. No one's going to be like, oh man. Yeah, like I said, no one's. No one's that, what kind of human being? It's engineering the PR. Yeah. Kind of yeah. So there's things like that. I, yeah, the marijuana they show, that's a whole different thing, obviously. But like in my example, for a while, when I was trying to keep it secret, mm -hmm. it was my top priority to keep it alive, not to set an example. So I tried to just keep it as hush hush as possible. Yeah, and the, the idea of, of growing our own economy, it would, it would include all these other things, uh, including, you know, legal defense, things like that. So um, the mutual aid concept is something like, you know, we might even have like an agorist chamber of commerce or, you know, something like that. Or an agorist, oh, that sounds uh, so boring. Triple A. Or, <laughs> <laughs> what it really is is like if, if you want uh, somebody to rush to your aid. Like right now, it's mutual aid is done here. It's just like... And, and there's there's all aspects that are being tried, you know, the Port 411, the Port 911 is trying to get revived. Civil and, disevolution, yeah, the mutual fine. aid uh, yeah. response team. Yeah, so all those different things uh, need to be done and done more, really. And uh, we need to have one that's probably focused on agorism, too. You know? And, and I'd, I'd pay, um, God, I hate to call it like a freedom tax, but I mean, I'd call it a... Uh, um, you know, what do you call it? or something like that. Yeah, yeah. which would essentially be insurance, yeah. Yeah, it's always the word. Freedom tax, right. Yeah. Uh, the uh, New Libertarian Manifesto towards the end lays out the different phases yeah. of uh, agorism, zero through four, uh, with zero being no agorist uh, pockets, and, and four being agorist pockets with small little statist uh, pockets. Uh, what phase do you guys think we're at, and, and do you see a, a certain level, obviously you can't predict it, but maybe a breaking point where he says, I think it's at, at the beginning of phase three, where the state reacts and starts crushing, and it's no longer a small underground, you know, small community, it starts becoming mainstream. We're in yeah. phase one, the low density agorist society, and uh, essentially as you build phase two, it's called mid density, and then um, at some point in phase two, um, they will start to be perceived as a threat. Pogroms, mass arrests may even occur, although that's unlikely. Uh, remember, most agorists are embedded in the rest of society, and associating with them are partially converted libertarians and counter-economists. So to, in order to reach this phase, the entire society has been connect, contaminated by agorism to a degree. And that's what I was talking about with the Soviet Union. There, the whole system was contaminated with, with people in the black market because they were all in it. Um, Phase three is when you get powerful enough, they, they really have to um, react to keep you from dominating, but the prediction is that we'll win. And then phase four is that it's a predominantly agorist society with the statists being treated as band, bands of outlaws, you know, like they really are, and then we're able to keep them under control. But I think that model is I don't want to keep anybody under control. <laughs> I think that model is much more accurate at the national level than at the state level. 
because I don't think we're ever going to get to the point where the state of New Hampshire is doing a mass crackdown on the agorist economy. We're already too entrenched in the political system. And it's a small state. Everyone knows each other. That kind of stuff is not going to happen here. It'll happen in small scale, like, you know, uh, you know, a, an individual agorist here or there might get shut down because they were violating a health code or something like that. But in terms of like a massive attack on the underground economy, they're, they're never going to do it here. Yeah, and there will be the, the small attacks, and that's why we, we have to have kind of mutual aid uh, support for somebody like that to keep them from being right. But that's right. a good point that the, the mutual aid doesn't have to be this huge system that's, yeah. you know, immensely capitalized and, and everything. It, it can probably work fine with the small. Like an insurance policy that covers active government. <laughs> Essentially, is what comes out. Yeah, you see it happening on Facebook uh, all the time now. And when something happens, you know, people put out an appeal, and you know, yeah. everybody rushes around. And yeah, if, if that's something you oh, want to support, can you everyone know. hear us? Because we're kind of like chatting amongst ourselves. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> There's an audience. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. No, I'm just, I don't know. It's uh, 45, 47. Okay. How much time we have here? Yeah. That's it. That's it. She already called it. <laughs> she called it. That, does anyone have any more questions? Anybody in the last one? All right. Well, hey, thanks for coming out, guys. Uh